I'm Austin Lugo. I'm Andrew Harp. This is With Nothing to Say. Let's talk about modern times. All right, before we get started today, next week we're going to be watching Piazza. This is a Bollywood film, a genre of films that has been completely off of my radar. I can say with some confidence that I've never seen a Bollywood film before. I've seen a couple of films by Indian directors, but honestly, I could probably count the number of Indian films I've seen on one hand. Thoughts on Bollywood films, Andrew? It's not a Bollywood film, but I do think that like in the United States, you know, there are different film cultures in different areas. You know, I think that the best movie that came out this year was an Indian movie, which was RRR, a movie that I think you should still watch. Amazing movie. But yeah, other than that, I haven't really watched a lot of Indian movies. Uh, definitely a bit of a, uh, a blind spot. Got to watch more. Well, now's your chance. But this week we're watching a movie that somehow you've never seen before. One of Sight and Sound's considered greatest films of all time. One of Charlie Chaplin's most famous films. Modern times. It's debatable. I mean, what would be more famous than modern times? City Lights. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. So I saw City Lights when I was a kid, but I haven't seen it since then. So I might as well have not seen it. But uh, there are things about it that I remember a little bit. There's that scene where they're like by a canal or something like that. And they're like, Charlie Chaplin is doing a lot of slipping and stuff. And I kind of remember the romance part of the movie as well a little bit. I was going to watch it this week, but I just didn't get around to it. That's all right. I mean, Charlie Chaplin, of course, one of the... Three great silent film stars, Charlie Chaplin, Harold Lloyd, and Buster Keaton. Charlie Chaplin is probably the most successful of the three. Him and Harold Lloyd both uh, created their own production company, but Charlie Chaplin is probably the most popular of the time and also the only one that seemed to really be able to function in the era of sound, which speaking of sound and talkies, This film is kind of strange in the sense that it was made in 1936. So the jazz singer came out in 1928. So there had been talkies for about eight years. The silent era is kind of very quickly dwindling down. There's not a lot of silent films that come out in the 30s. And yet, despite this... He just really likes silent films. Yeah, he just doesn't give a shit. I mean, yeah, there is like talking in the movie, but not very much. I think there's some interesting things done with sound for sure especially with like whenever he's at the factory or you know some of the sounds of police officers or uh, the talking salesman that's like played on a record yeah that's cool but otherwise i mean it's pretty much a silent film which thinking of the silent film stars they seem almost uninterested in films about talking and and kind of listening to the process in which Buster Keaton wrote his films. And that's not necessarily to say that Charlie Chaplin and Harold Lloyd did the same thing, but it seems to be of the era is often the silent film stars didn't really have scripts. It was kind of just like they had a basic idea of what the film was, which I would say modern times is kind of just a series of skits, just like the general or the freshman or kind of any of these uh, famous silent films. And then they just came up with a bunch of gags for each skit. But there was no like overlining plot or anything like that. Like it's just a series of skits and it kind of just loosely comes together to be a feature film. I would agree, which I'm okay with because that's good uh, comedy movie uh, thinking for sure. It's to kind of, you know, really kind of like stick to you and develop those gags. And there's some there's some really good ones in modern times. A lot of stuff that looks familiar to me. Just like stuff like I've seen like a few like Charlie Chaplin like short films and like I think there's one where he's like skating in this movie he skates. I don't know. There were some like gags and locations that looked a little familiar to me. I think there are some things that uh, really uh, work well that he's found. By this point, he definitely knows what works for him and what doesn't. And of course, in this film, kind of plays this tramp character. I mean, not he's not like the tramp the same way he is in like the kid or. I don't know what you mean by that. By the tramp character. Like, what do you mean by that? So like in most of Charlie Chaplin's films, he plays the same character which is the tramp and so he he has like this specific type of dress it's like these really baggy pants and kind of like this torn up button coat it's sort of supposed to be but how is that character different in modern times than in others like what do you mean 
Well, in modern times, he's not really the tramp character because he doesn't have his traditional tramp dress. So like typically what he's wearing when he's the tramp is like these really baggy pants with like a bunch of holes in them because he basically wears a tuxedo, but it's like this really torn out tuxedo. So it's supposed to be this juxtaposition because of course, like his early films came out in the 1920s. So it's supposed to be this juxtaposition between the roaring 20s, but then also the kind of impoverished man where in this film, he's more of a, I mean, he still is a similar character, right? He's kind of just this man who fumbles from one success to the other. But I think that he's, he's down and out. He doesn't have any money. But this kind of differentiates himself, I think, from a lot of his films, because in most of his films, like it's just a series of unfortunate events. But you could argue that modern times is just a series of fortunate events. Like he kind of just fumbles himself from one success to another. But in the end, they're unsuccessful. Yeah. I guess that's true. But I mean, like, you know, all of the in-between parts, they they seem to do pretty well. I don't know. He loses all of his jobs. He gets jobs and then he loses them right away. Well, that's kind of just because he's really bad at all of the jobs he does. Yeah. Is he bad? Like, I always kind of just seems like he has really bad luck. Well, I mean, the best way to do it is just run through the different jobs he has and kind of see if it's luck or not. So he's got, he's got his first job, which, of course, is a Fritz Lang style. Yeah, it's like the most famous scene in the movie. The whole that whole part the whole uh him working what with like two screwdrivers he's like tightening bolts it doesn't even matter doesn't even matter <laughs> he's, he's working on a factory and he's got to do a thing very fast he's got to do a thing very fast they all have their one thing they got to do and there's this big brother style boss who's got like these giant ass tvs yeah that shit was awesome <laughs> the design of the factory is probably one of my favorite designs in the film and probably one of my favorite sets of all time it's just a really creative interesting and terrifying set it's weird and awesome to kind of look at uh these kind of predictions of the future from like the 1920s and 30s you know kind of similar to metropolis because you know there's some kind of surreal aspects to it like things to get right you know kind of like the big brother giant cameras and stuff well, and then... yeah just kind of like you know, employees being constantly uh, monitored by their employers <laughs> and stuff like that Maybe not as literal as the in modern times, but it's about the same. Brandon told me this story where he used to work at Punch Pizza, which was this local pizza chain in Minneapolis. And there's the story, which who knows if it's true or not, but supposedly the owner of the small franchise Punch Pizza, which had like four or five locations, he had cameras in each and every kitchen that uh, were all direct feeds to his house. And supposedly in his house, he had a room where he would watch people make uh, punch pizza for pizza accuracy. And this wasn't like just like a urban legend. Like this is something that on like training day, like they would tell all their employees. Wow, that's cool. That's awesome. That's a little fucked up, but okay. I don't know if it's true or not, but the fact that they tell their employees that, like even if it's not true, it's still pretty disturbing. Yeah, I don't, I don't like that at all. They also do it in other ways, not just cameras, right? They do it like going on your computer. <clears throat> you know, they might be able to like track what you're doing on your like office computer or something like that. So that kind of thing can, can happen in many different ways other than, you know, staring at someone like through a camera or seeing if they're doing something right. They can also like kind of monitor you in other ways that are very uh, bad. <laughs> yeah, but in this case, Charlie Chaplin is just a poor lowly factory worker just uh tightening some bolts and as he's tightening bolts he, he finally gets his break his like two minute bathroom break or whatever and so he punches out and of course he goes into the bathroom and the moment he lights a cigarette there's this giant tv in there and uh they demand that he goes back to work because why should he be lazy enough to smoke a cigarette and so he goes back to work and while he's working they introduce the like automatic feeding machine how would you even describe this machine <laughs> it's just like these guys like come in with this like weird looking machine and it's just like yeah you hook them up to a worker and they can eat and like drink or whatever while they work or whatever so they don't have to like stop working you don't have to waste time with the lunch break anymore <laughs> yeah and so they of course they test it on on charlie chaplin and that's pretty funny it goes wild and it like i like like the corn like apparatus just like keeps like smacking into Chaplin's face I laughed like how like long that kept on like hitting him that made me laugh and the whole thing that they put together was really great it looks great it's funny 
And I mean, they had to build the machine. So it's also impressive that they just built this just strangely made machine in which like Charlie Chaplin, which seems like a lot of the uh, stunts, I guess you could say they're not stunts in the same way, say like in a, in a Buster Keaton film, but there's still quite a bit of just pretty physical. Yeah, there, there's a lot of physical stuff that, that seems quite dangerous. And I feel like being strapped into this machine because it is like, I mean, I'm sure they probably just use like a series of pulleys or, or something of that sort. Like it's probably not electric, but even so, it still feels dangerous somehow. I don't know. The whole thing feels a little bit a bit dangerous. I agree with you. I think even when he goes in like the gears, the very famous scene where he goes in the gears, I thought that looked kind of scary because it's actually it's definitely him actually like in like kind of like, you know, cut out set. But I don't know. I don't think I would be able to like do that. You know, like I think Charlie Chaplin is probably the right size and flexible enough to do something like that. You know, <laughs> yeah, Charlie Chaplin just he doesn't give a shit. He does whatever it takes to get the shot. Andrew, you got to do whatever it takes to get the shot. I suppose so. Yeah. But eventually he gets fired from the factory because i mean he basically just has a mental breakdown like he just goes he goes fucking nuts he goes crazy he like he just he destroys the factory <laughs> which i i liked i like that he's just like i'm gonna destroy everything like i'm so pissed off and upset i'm gonna destroy i'm gonna blow up the whole factory so good on him he's a true socialist what are they called those those uh people in the 1920s but also in like Early industrial revolutions, like 1880s or even before that. You're talking about Luddites? Yeah, Luddites. He's like he's like a modern Luddite. <laughs> yeah, I fuck with Luddism. I think that's what it's called. Ludditism. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he's going nuts. And, and, you know, of course, the movie's got a lot of stuff like that. A lot of, you know, uh, commentary about industrialism and war and labor and stuff like that. There's definitely a lot in there to uh, pick apart, I guess. Yeah, I think what's intriguing and perhaps a little bit terrifying about the film is the only place that Charlie Chaplin's character is truly ever able to find any solace is in prison. The only place where he seems to be at peace with the world or just happy in general is when he's completely taken out of the workforce because whenever he gets any sort of job, like it just ends up pretty terribly. So like the only way to find any sort of happiness in modern times is to basically just be taken out of it, like just to be completely isolated from the modern uh, capitalistic workforce. Yeah, he gets like arrested after getting fired and then he like starts to really like being in jail because they just he, he just chills. He just hangs out. I don't think I would want to be in a modern prison, though. I think Charlie Chaplin, if he was in modern prison, he would be like, no, I don't want to be here. Yeah, prison in the 1930s looked pretty sweet. It looked like a pretty sweet kick. In the movie world of 1930s, uh, yeah, being in jail, being in prison looked really great. Uh, just chilling out, doing nothing. You know, that's awesome. And uh, he like it stops a jailbreak, which is the, the Charlie Chaplin movies. They have a lot of hitting in them. They have a lot of fighting. I've noticed. Yeah, I guess I never, I never thought about the amount of like physical uh, fights in them, but it's a great fight scene. Because, uh, of course, like all the scenes, Charlie Chaplin doesn't really know what he's doing. He's kind of just fumbling his way. And he's just slamming doors on people and, and running around. And he has no idea what he's doing. But it's I love that whole gag of the prison scene in which he's kind of just following orders in the sense that like he just marches from one place to the other. And of course, right, when everyone marches into the cell, instead of turning right, he turns left <laughs> and just like wraps around the tree a couple of times. I just really like watching a movie. You know, it's like I'm taking my time with these Chaplin movies because they really have a lot of like stuff going on in every one of them. You know, you really got to pay attention to them. It's not really a Chaplin movie and, you know, also a Keaton movie. You know, it's really not the time to be like looking at your phone. It's really not the time to be like doing anything else. You really got to like just chill and like watch it. And that's one of the things that I really love about silent era films and even films, you know, going up to the 1940s. I think, you know, honestly, the longest film you're going to watch is hour and 40, hour and 45 minutes. And within that hour and 45 minutes, it honestly feels like more is accomplished and done than, say, you know, so many three-hour films. Like, they're just, as you said, jam-packed with scene after scene after scene. And especially with silent films, because they can't 
you know, lean on these like long scenes in which like people just, you know, give these giant speeches and that sort of thing. Like they're entirely. Yeah. It's more like about the action than about the dialogue. It's not something you can listen to because there's nothing to listen to for the most part. It's definitely a visual film. And Charlie Chaplin was kind of like one of the people who very early on pushed having as few title cards as possible because there are plenty of silent films that have a lot of talking quote unquote in them. And those are probably my least favorite type of silent films because they're just kind of a hassle to get through because there's just a whole lot of reading. Like it's a lot of just people staying around talking card, people staying around talking card. I would strongly suggest not watching those types of films, but none of, you know, the big Buster Keaton, Charlie Chaplin, Harold Lloyd, they don't really do that, but I have seen enough silent films to have fumbled upon a couple. There's not a ton, at least that still exists. I'm sure like at the time it was a lot more popular, but they can be quite a slog to get through because it's just pretty boring. I mean, (laughs) you're just, you're basically just reading title cards. Yeah, that's cool. Not even subtitles. There's one thing to read subtitles, but to read endless title cards, is just like, like, I don't know what to say. Charlie Chaplin refuses. He's He's a man of few words and many actions. It's true. He is able to get out of jail for stopping the prison break, which he's upset about, which is very funny that he's upset about that because he wants to chill in the jail. But the guy's like, you're free to go. You get a job. And he's like, oh, okay." And the sheriff gives him a letter and he gets like a shipbuilder job, which I mean, that job lasts like 10. We're talking about how like how bad like Charlie Chaplin is at his jobs or whatever. He literally has a job for 10 seconds. Literally the first task this man is given. Yeah, he's given his first task. And he destroys like a boat that they're repairing, which is a great gag. Looks great. Like an entire boat. Yeah, the boat washes into the sea. And it literally, I just love it. There's no follow through. It's just that happens. And then it just cuts to the next scene. <laughs> and then I think around this time too, you're introduced to Ellen, who's the heroine. How old is she supposed to be in the movie? I think she's supposed to be under 18. Is she? Why do you say, oh, because she lives with her dad? She lives with her dad and also just because like the juvenile police are like following her. Yeah, that's a good point. How old is Charlie Chaplin supposed to be? I don't know. I mean, he's pretty old by the time. I mean, he's pretty old by the time this movie comes out, right? He's like in his 40s or 50s. Yeah, I think he's in his 40s by the time this movie comes out. Paulette Goddard, who plays Ellen, she's uh, 26 in 1936. But I don't know. They make it seem like she's like a kid, like she's under 18. Even though she does not look like she's 18. No. Or like under 18. (laughs) She looks like she is in her late 20s, early 30s. Yeah. She looks like an adult. So I think most people would be like, oh, yeah. But for some reason, like, yeah, she's being chased by like juvenile police. Like, why is it so bad that she walks away from the police that one time? Why do they need her so bad? Like after her dad dies? Why can't she just walk away if she's an adult? Because... Is she the guardian for the other kids? No, the ki- the other kids are taken away, remember? Yeah, I don't know. I think she's supposed to be under 18, which... That complicates things. <laughs> it's kind of weird. I just wouldn't think about it. Yeah, don't think about it at all. She doesn't look that young at all. She does not look that young. Like, it's completely like your brain, you're watching it, and your brain is completely thinking like, yeah, this is like a 20-something-year-old person. Yeah. <laughs> Like, I don't think your brain would, yeah, it, it doesn't make any sense. But anyway, yeah, her dad dies. He gets shot, like, in a protest, I think, like a labor protest because he can't get a job. And she has two little sisters, and they get, like I said, we talked about, they get taken by the police, and then she runs away. And then she's, like, a fugitive, I guess. And uh, they eventually uh, meet through, uh, yeah, she steals a loaf of bread. And the police go to arrest her, and Charlie Chaplin decides that, he stole the red loaf of bread because he just wants to go back. This poor man just wants to go back to this jail. Part, this part of the movie is so funny. <laughs> it's so good. And so like the next like 20 minutes is just a series of gags in which Charlie Chaplin just tries to get arrested. Like just oh, a so series funny. of events. <laughs> yeah, the loaf of bread thing, it doesn't work at all. And everyone just refuses to arrest this man. Like he just, <laughs> I love it. He has like that giant meal where he just eats like a, a shit ton of food. It's so funny. He refuses that... to pay for it. He gets himself a cigar. He's... He, yeah, he goes and eats at the restaurant. He eats a bunch of stuff. And then he like calls the cop over and he's like, I can't pay for it. <laughs> and he's like, OK, well, and, he, and then you arrest him. And then they're like, at, yeah, they're like a newspaper stand. And he like lights up a cigar there or whatever, just to like, I don't know, rub it in. And uh, yeah, they're like in a paddy wagon together. And they still don't end up in jail because I believe it gets into an accident, right? Well, what happens is the woman fights with the guard and then they like 
they're pushed out. But then I think, yeah, I think the paddy wagon like crashes or falls over or whatever. But suffice it to say that uh, unfortunately, poor Charlie Chaplin is still a free man. And that's where we hear probably the most famous song from a Charlie Chaplin film, Smile. I think it's probably the mo- his most famous song. I can't think of another one that I would know. But as they're playing that song, uh, you get the domestic. Yeah, they're just chilling. Yeah, they do that little thing where like they're like, wow, what if we had a house? And they imagine themselves being there like in the house and chilling and eating or whatever. I don't think she has any shoes at this point either. You know, she's just wearing her black dress. She has no shoes. Kind of weird if she's supposed to be under 18. Wouldn't think about it. <laughs> she's like young at heart. Yeah, so they have their little thing and then... uh I think what they go to like a a department store right after that, which I like. I like the department store. It's great. It's a great looking department store. It's a great set. And of course, we get the uh, very famous, as you were talking about earlier, the roller skating scene. That scene's crazy. I was rewatching it this morning and I'm trying to figure out that scene where he's like roller skating next to the ledge. No, I, be- I bet it isn't a ledge at all. It's probably just an illusion. It's still amazing that he's able to roller skate while blindfolded so well. He's clearly done it a lot. For some reason, just really good at it. That must have been just like a much more popular thing. We watched a movie, a movie not as good, but still there's like, like a lot of roller skating. Uh, obviously, Charlie Chaplin is a better roller skater than the couple in uh, the other movie that we watched. Ginger Rogers and Fred Astaire. <laughs> yeah, he's great. But uh, Charlie Chaplin's crazy. He's just able to skate for several minutes blindfolded. He's insane moves. He's, he's, he's spinning crazy. around. He's, he's jumping. Guy. It's yeah. And he and he's there because he got a job as a night watchman. And so they decided to take advantage of it. So they eat all the food and they sleep in the beds there. And they just again bad at bad at his job. He's really bad at his job. Like he's basically stealing in this instance. And like we talked about though, like I really like how the set looks. You know, it's fun. They're chilling there at night, stealing shit, and just kind of like that's fun. Yeah, absolutely. And it is a truly great juxtaposition between, of course, the 1930s Great Depression juxtaposed to these very elaborate and fancy and kind of rich people department stores, right? There's like all this space that no one's living in. You know, there's all this stuff, right? They're wearing these fancy coats and all these like bets. You know, at 1% or whatever, you have this rising inequality. Charlie Chaplin's a true socialist. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) sure. But Charlie Chaplin, you know, he, he's doing the best he can. He's really skating around. And of course, immediately burglarized within like the first. It's so funny. First night. I love that scene where they're like telling him to freeze and he keeps living on his roller skates. That is so fucking funny. <laughs> they're like telling him to stop and he's like, he can't. It's so good. He's like rolling down this escalator, which seems, again, just like an extremely dangerous stunt to be roller skating down an escalator. But he has so much control, you know, so I think he's fine. It's insane. And so they're shooting at him. And of course, they end up shooting a barrel of rum. This is such a classic, like, silent film type thing, right? Where the character, like, gets drunk somehow, either accidentally or on purpose. And so then they're drunk and then they do, like, you know, wacky stuff with their body and stuff. Very classic silent film stuff. But of course, to uh, Charlie Chaplin's great luck, the man who's burglarizing him just happens to be the same man that he worked with at the factory so they're like best buds instead of murdering him i guess they all have some champagne and eat some food and you know it's like the next morning ellen gets away and then charlie chaplin is like found like just obviously you know just super drunk under a pile of clothes great gag yeah he's he's so funny and yeah he gets fired once again, Charlie failed that job. This is like the third or fourth job he's had in the movie and he failed once again. But yeah, the whole department store set piece, it's really good. Maybe not as good as like the factory, but it's really good. And then from this set piece, we are introduced immediately to our next set piece, which is this old decrepit house where everything has to be like in its very specific spot. There's a whole great Buster Keaton one week, right? Where it's like, there, it's just fucking with the fucked up house. And uh, it's the same thing here, basically. And yeah, you got the roof caving in. And every time Charlie Chaplin sits anywhere, like the floor just caves in. It's cute. They clearly build it. A very wonderful set. And I imagine just a very hard set to build correctly because you have to like, right? You kind of have to be like in the exact right spot. Like I'm thinking of like when he sits in the chair and it like goes down, right? You have to be like on those exact boards. 
that would hurt too. Can you imagine like sitting in a chair and then honestly, it just like full, like hits the ground. That would like ruin my day if that happened to me (laughs) because it would scare you and it would hurt. And it was just like, I don't know. It's incredible. And then they're also eating just like the world's like Scooby-Doo style sandwiches. Yeah, but they, you know, they live in the shack and, you know, they're hanging out, chilling in it. They're being happy. They're living their life. They're living the, their best life. And of course, Charlie Chaplin uh, reads the newspaper, you know, again, kind of another classic move, right? They're eating and he's sitting at the table reading the newspaper. <laughs> And he finds that the factory has reopened. Because he destroyed it earlier. Because he destroyed it, yeah. <laughs> so I guess in his mind, the best course of action is to go back to the factory and, and just work again, which I love that he just gets the job again. Because, yeah, I think now he has a reason to get a job because he wants to support Ellen. He's in love. He gets back to the factory. He pushes through everybody. He's the most unqualified person in the crowd. A lot, a lot of extras in this movie, too, by the way. There's a lot of scenes where there's a lot of crowds, I've noticed. Just like tons of people. And yeah, he like pushes through a group to get to the front and yeah, he gets a job and you get another kind of semi factory set piece where he's like an assistant to a mechanic. And like the other set piece at the factory, it's just a series of gears. But instead of Charlie Chaplin getting stuck this time, he gets his boss, the mechanic, like stuck in this extremely elaborate set of gears. So like the front's like a a facade and then I guess they just kind of like push the guy into like a hole. Like between the facade. They look good. They look good in black and white, especially. They look great. But he completely fucks everything up. And poor Charlie Chaplin. They smush everything. He smushes his stuff. That's very cartoony. Even for like a silent Chaplin Keaton film. I mean, that's something that you would see like in a like at a like in a Looney Tunes cartoon where something gets smushed by something and it's completely flat. <laughs> <laughs> It's wonderful. The mechanic gets stuck within the gears. And I love the scene where uh, Charlie Chaplin tries to feed him. He like tries to feed him his lunch. He gives him like a cup of coffee. He gives him a sandwich, a piece of cake. And for some reason, this man has packed an entire chicken, like just like a whole fucking rotisserie chicken. I'd eat it. It's like a small chicken. I think when people think of rotisserie chicken, they think of like the ones you would get at like Costco or Walmart that are, you know, filled with steroids <laughs> and are gigantic. Yeah. It's just like a normal sized one. That's still a lot of food, though. I mean, that's... I guess, yeah. You'd eat it later. <laughs> I guess. Because I have a, it's a, it's a later snack. But unfortunately, uh, <laughs> Charlie Chaplin does not get to keep this job like as many other jobs. Really? Wow. Again. He's incompetent. He's he's just bad. Completely incompetent. <laughs> I don't even think they fire him because then they go on strike, right? Yes. Oh, and he also gets arrested again. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Charlie Chaplin. But he doesn't go to jail because he never gets to go to jail because he just... No, he does go to jail. He's there for a couple weeks. Yeah. There's just like no real scenes in the jail. You never see him in there. Yeah. He just like goes and comes back. Because like then Ellen gets a job while he's in jail. She gets a job as a dancer. And so he gets a job as like a waiter, I guess. At the a singer and waiter, singer and waiter. <laughs> I Which, love the scene again. Another great, another another silent film trope is like <sighs> uh, restaurants or waiters <sighs> and stuff like that. I think literally yep. like Chaplin has a movie or like a short film where he's like at a restaurant or something like that. Um, or, 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 or maybe even Keaton does. Maybe I'm getting the confused. You know, just like the out I think indoor it's thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I think it's a Keaton film thing. Yeah, is like very like I, I feel like I've seen that before, where it's like Chaplin goes in the outdoor and you know, you know, hits somebody who's like carrying a big tray and it gets all over. Like, I think I've seen that before, but it's still done really well here. Um, it's just you know, classic restaurant stuff. You know, Chaplin's like a bad waiter. You know, th- there's a guy who's complaining because he hasn't gotten his food yet in like an hour. Um. And so he's like, Chaplin's like running around and he's running into people. And, you know, once again, you know, just like a good like setting to have like silent film gags in. Yeah. And something that I didn't think about until uh, this rewatch was the similarities between this film and Playtime, because they both have a very similar opening in like the kind of like a modern industrialist kind of like futuristic sort of thing going on and then they also both have a a long restaurant scene where there's kind of like very similar gags that's true yeah <clears throat> yeah Mon- yeah in the restaurant the restaurant still feel- feels a little old to me old timey you know 
but yeah, it's uh, you know, like we said, like the the restaurant is just a good because people because you know bad things happen in restaurants all the time. You know what I mean? Like fuck, like uh, this, like you know, like like shit happens at restaurants all the time. So you know, I think it makes sense to kind of have a you know be have it. Of course, you got to have the restaurant job, right? In the in the movie where he has a bunch of different jobs. And you know, restaurant jobs, whether it be you know in fast food or in, uh, uh, you know, just like at a regular restaurant, um, you know, these jobs probably have multiplied since then, you know, uh, by a hundred, uh, compared to today, which there's so many and they they're so shitty, you know, uh, so that's probably a good prediction, maybe not a prediction, but just something uh, you know I've noticed. Yeah. The restaurant industry hasn't exactly been uh, the greatest industry to work in, <laughs> and I guess even back in the back in the nineteen thirties, it still sucked. So it's good to know that some things don't change. Yeah, some things change, but some things don't change. But of course, this is uh, how we end our film. No, he's got to sing a song. He sings a song. Yes. Which I I did not expect that. I didn't expect that to happen. I didn't realize I I read and read that this is his last film as the tramp character, which kind of made sense to me. Yeah. Um, when watching the movie, and it's also the first movie where I think you hear his voice is what I read as well. So he like he writes like the lyrics on his uh the cuffs right, and he goes out there, and of course he has to he loses the cuffs obviously like he doesn't have the lyrics now, but so instead he just kind of um sings gibberish and pantomimes and he kills it. Everyone goes crazy. They love it. They love his gibberish. It's such an epic. Uh, it's such an epic performance. He crushes it. Just he kills it. He doesn't even say any words, and he doesn't even have to say <laughs> words, and he kills it. That's that's just how great he is. Have you s- seen any of Charlie Chaplin's later work, like any of the stuff where he talks? No, I haven't seen like the great. No, I mean like outside of like a bunch of short films that I've seen by his. This is and City Lights, which I saw when I was a kid. I mean, yeah, like I haven't seen really any other Chaplin features besides this one. Yeah, that's that's baffling. It, it, I am. Truly it's not baffled. that bad. It's it's really like how many <laughs> other people in the like I don't understand what's wrong with that. Like I'm just taking my time with them. I know. I mean, that's great. I love it. <clears throat> They're lovely. I guess it, they are lovely. It's just I've seen way more know, at this point. I've seen way more Keaton works by Keaton than Chaplin at this point. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Chaplin, Chaplin's high on the list, you know, Chaplin's high on the list. Like I said, I was going to watch City Lights this week, but I just didn't get to it. I was probably going to watch others too, but I just, you know, I just didn't get to it. Um, like I said, it, it deserves my undivided attention. That's true. His films do require a bit of dedication, but they are short. I mean, you know, 90 minutes top, even like his talkies. I think The Great Dictator is not more than 90 minutes. Maybe it's closer to two hours to two hours but they're great i mean i i understand why his talkies weren't as popular as his silent films there's other shit going on at the time because there's other shit going on and are his like talking films like when they come out are they like the best talkie films of the era isn't there one isn't there one in the 50s that he makes where he goes to new york and he's like old as fuck uh limelight no not that one another Uh, one it's like, a, it's like a typical... no it's like a <laughs> it's like a charlie chaplin film in the 50s where he's old and he goes to new york it's like it has new york in the title i'm gonna look this up i need to know the answer to this uh let's see cast crew charlie chaplin <sighs> it's a, a king in new york oh yes and i've seen this one yeah that's one of that's pretty late in his career how many films did he have a, not many because 1957 i mean he's an old man by this point i remember it i don't really remember much of anything about this film to be honest yeah <laughs> i'm sure it's fine but not very memorable i would say his most memorable film of the talking era is probably limelight and i think that's just because what works about limelight is it's a film about a uh aging movie star so it's very autobiographical in that sense and buster keaton gives a great performance in that film too uh also very depressing performance it's not a happy film city light or not city lights limelight yes thank you (laughs) is a 
pretty in the dumps film, but I think it's probably his strongest film in the talking era because like Harold Lloyd and Buster Keaton, I mean, he really is at his best when he's doing his silent gags, you know, in this kind of modern times sort of stuff where he's just fumbling from one place to another and, you know, uh, just living in the in the physical aspects. They just, they're just of a different era, I guess. I mean, are there really any famous film movie stars directors that kind of made the jump like successfully made the jump between silent and talkies i can't think of any because like all the great silent film directors didn't really direct much once like sound came along and that's same with like most of the movie stars it which is it's a very strange like moment in film history because there's not really another moment where that happens right the world of filmmaking kind of has this interesting cyclical pattern to it in which you know, when filmmaking first started, like in the early 1910s and 20s, it was really accessible. Like it was very cheap to get a camera and some film. And since there was no sound or anything, like pretty much anyone could make it. I mean, even, you know, Buster Keaton. They say in Singing in the Rain as they, <laughs> one of my favorite movies. Like <laughs> like he was just, he didn't have a whole lot of money. He just kind of had a friend and a camera and they just kind of like made shit and was very accessible, very easy. But by the 1930s, sound came along, which at the time was super expensive. And then you have the studio system. I mean, I'm glad that we're of an era currently where filmmaking is for the first time and say like- even, even the people that have a lot of resources, that they just, it seems like they continually make bad movies as well. So I think one of the things, there's a bit of hindsight bias, right? When we look at films from the past, because- Obviously, there's always been bad films since the beginning of films, but most of those just simply don't survive, right? They're impossible to find. Like out of every hundred films, like what one out of every hundred films probably survives of the past hundred years, because really until the 1960s with people like Jean-Luc Godard and Francois Truffaut, who really pushed the idea of art being, you know, cinema or an art form, no one kept track of like these reels. Like it I mean, there's, you know, even some of the famous uh, Buster Keaton films are almost impossible to find because like no one gave a shit. They thought you just show them and then no one took care of these reels. So they were just sort of lost to history. So anything you do see from these eras, Ray, are the best of the best. So I think that's also part of it is just like we have so much access to every film, whereas, you know, the further we go back, the less amount of films we can see, right? How many films outside of you know, the most famous actors, directors, can you see of the 1920s or even the 30s? So. At least we have all of Chaplin's movies, probably. I'm guessing. Yeah, I'm, I'm assuming he's famous enough that, like, there's nothing lost. Probably just unmade. Um, You know, this movie has a, you know, to kind of get to finish out Watered Tives, I guess, you know. he He sings, but then the police arrive to arrest Ellen. And they got to run away again. And then you get the iconic ending where like Chaplin like tells her to smile or whatever, even though they're both like upset. And then they walk in the middle of the street with kind of like their silhouettes, you know, once again, you know, feel free to ignore or not ignore the age, the I guess, age difference between them. I don't know. Maybe Chaplin is supposed to be younger than he is. Who knows? Unclear. But it is a sweet, it's a sweet scene. It's a sweet scene. It's a sweet moment. Um, where they kind of just like walk down the road and uh to nothing, kind of. I I guess it's kind of bittersweet because they they've failed multiple times, and now they're kind of like, I don't know, going out west. I guess kind of like a, you know, kind of a return away from modern life and maybe like a return to, I don't know, uh, more um, uh, difficult but uh, less you know, modernized world, I guess. Um, I don't know. That's at least how I see that. I mean, you can only hope so much for Charlie Chaplin since he is incapable. Oh, uh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Existing in the market. He's a man at a time. He do begin in uh, trouble a lot. He do, he do, he, he does mess up a lot. You know, he's, he's, he's a Charlie Chaplin character. <laughs> so... I don't know how best to interpret this ending if, you know, we're supposed to be sort of happy in the sense that, you know, they have each other and they have love and, you know, that should be enough and that's all you need. 
but then at the same time they're completely incapable of living in a modern society in which everyone is forced into this big brother style labor and there's not really anything you can do about it and no matter you know what you do no matter how hard you try you're just going to end up in the exact same place still good though yeah once again you know it has its sweet and sad elements to it but iconic looking ending iconic final shot you know iconic fucking movie well andrew uh final thoughts on modern times you know, it's kind of fun to learn that it's like the uh, it's Chaplin's last like kind of movie in this role. You know, it kind of feels like kind of him taking everything that he's done and learned from like maybe previous efforts and kind of like making them better or like tweaking them and really kind of like just kind of going all out for it and tons of different set pieces where he's being very physical. He's doing a lot of running around. Um, I didn't even mention the person that plays Paulette Goddard, who plays Ellen. She's really good too. You know, she does a lot of running around. She's very physical in the movie for the most part. Um, she doesn't really like sit around, you know, <clears throat> like we talked about, you know, when Charlie has to use, when Chaplin has to use sound, you know, he does a really good job with it. Um, and there's plenty of like, sometimes the commentary can be a little bit like overbearing or a little on the nose, but I think for the most part, it's pretty uh, smart and uh, fun to watch. And, you know, it's just, you know, a movie that, you know, in retrospect has like interesting stuff in it that I think, of course, you know, makes a lot of sense today. Um, yeah, you know, once again, you know, it just it has, a, it's just a packed movie with tons of great visuals, good sets. You know, it, it does make me laugh. You know, I really do think that, like, you know, um, a lot, you know, I think if if you're 13, would this make you laugh? I don't know. You know, like, if you're 13 right here, right now, if you watch this, I don't know if you would find it funny. But I don't know. Like, I think it's still a funny movie. I think it's still good. I think it's still really, uh, 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 I think there are still lots of, like, jokes and stuff that work. and 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 there's also a lot of stuff that make me kind of, like, go like oh wow you know kind of that i find amazing maybe not as funny but amazing but you know it's there's really not much to say else about it i mean i think i'm gonna stick with um i think i'm bordering an eight and a nine but i think i'll stick with a nine yeah i mean when it comes to charlie chaplin he truly is one of the greats <laughs> i don't think anyone's made much of a mistake on that i'm not sure if we said anything new about modern times that hasn't been said a million times over but as far as Chaplin films goes I find this film to be a little underwhelming relative to say some of his earlier work I mean I understand why people love this film and it is an incredible film and the comedic aspects I do think are eternal and there's just some you know, beautiful physical work in this but for me it feels like some of the gags don't live up to some of the standards that he had earlier, especially in sort of his two reelers. And I think part of that is just the fact that, you know, by this point, Charlie Chaplin is the Charlie Chaplin. I mean, he's one of the most well-known uh, actors and directors of his time. So, you know, he's extremely wealthy, extremely popular, and perhaps there's a bit of pressure to create certain types of films. And he certainly succeeds in this, but for me, I think I'd rather take The Kid or City Lights over Modern Times. Still a wonderful film. Great sound design, great music. Charlie Chaplin does a great job. Very physical, very funny. So I'm going to give this a 9 out of 10 because I think it's great. But with the asterisk that there are better Charlie Chaplin films. All right, y'all. Thank you for listening. You can find everything I do at Austin Lugo 1-2. Yeah, I'm on Twitter at ADHarp24. I'm also on Letterboxd at RetroAndrew, or tr 0 Andrew. And you can find this podcast wherever you hear podcasts. You can also find us on Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube at Fear42, or with nothing to say. And thank you all for listening. Thanks again.